And this is Kate Crawford, who is here uh, with us today from the University of uh, New South Wales uh, in Australia, which you'll notice immediately once you start speaking. Um, and she's also visiting us at uh, Microsoft Research for a couple of weeks. And she is at the Journalism and Me Media Research Center um, and is here to tell us about the art of noise. Thank you, Dana. And thanks, everyone, for coming along in your lunch break. Can everyone hear me? For the internet. Uh, OK, for the internet. Um, this is who I am, and this is uh, what we're going to be talking about today. I'm really very much going to take this as a work in progress. So what I'm going to share with you is, first of all, the findings from a study that I'm currently working on. And this is a three-year study looking at mobile and social media in Australia. And the second thing I'm going to do is talk about some really early emerging ideas around how we analyse and think about noise and attention. But before I get there, I just want to say a huge thank you to the Berkman Centre for having me along and for AMAR for arranging to get me in the room. It's absolutely a pleasure to be here. So, to get started, I'm going to take us back to 1741. And now this might seem like a <coughs> relatively unusual place to start talking about mobile and social media, but I'd like you to keep this image in your hindbrain if you can while we have this discussion today. This is an engraving by William Hogarth from 1741 called The Enraged Musician. And you can see the enraged musician who's up there in his window having a look at the streets of London. And he's furious because, as you can see, there's a town crier, there's a woman holding song sheets with a crying baby, there's a boy who's using a drum, there's a man sharpening his knives, there's a boy pissing under his window, in fact. <laughs> and um, this is all of the cacophony of commerce and human life, as well as the attendant anxieties about growing industrialization in the UK in the 1700s. And I think if we fast forward to the 21st century, we can think about a new kind of noise complaint. And that's the complaint about networked conversation. And it doesn't come to us through the windows, but it reaches us nonetheless via our mobile phones, via Twitter, via Facebook, sometimes in 140 character bursts. It's important here, of course, that many forms of social and mobile media, media are not actually audio. They're not sound based. But I think by using these kinds of oral metaphors, we can get to a different sense of a nuanced understanding about how we engage with these modes. We often tune in over the course of the day, just checking in what people are saying, maybe on Facebook, maybe on Twitter. And I think Nick Caldry says it best, he's a media theorist in the UK, that in fact oral metaphors are a very productive way of thinking about the intersubjective nature of contemporary networked media. The other thing I like about using the term listening in this space is that it implies that there's a limit to our listening, where all of these various channels become like noise. So with that in mind, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this study that's currently underway. It's funded by the ARC, it's a discovery grant, it's called Young Mobile Networked. It's actually the largest study in Australia of mobile and social media use by 18 to 30 year olds. And I'm conducting this with my colleague, Jared Goggin. And we've pretty much got two years under the belt and a year to go. So this is very much by way of early findings, which I'll be sharing with you from the, quantita the qualitative side. The quant work is just about to begin in the next couple of months. So choosing the 18 to 30 cohort was somewhat controversial because talking about young people, we often see quite younger cohorts being studied. But given the way in which the term youth is being mobilized in this space, we thought it was going to be quite interesting <laughs> to capture a wider age range of people and also to compare what was happening for the 18, 19 and 20 year olds with the 28, 29 and 30 year olds. And it's also a really fascinating time to be studying what's happening with mobile media. At the moment, we've just gone past the five billion mark for mobile subscriptions worldwide. In Australia, we now have more mobile phones than we have human beings. We've got to around 110 to 115% mobile subscription penetration. So obviously, Australia is a country that's very accustomed to using the mobile phone. But even more so, I think it's a critical period of metamorphosis for the mobile, that we can no longer talk about the mobile qua mobile. It is, in fact, a space of media rather than just a space where we take and receive calls. So this might mean using it as an MP3 player, as a camera, as a place of sharing and making media, but also as a portal for where we connect through to other kinds of media spaces. And of course, social media is a very important one here. 
So not that we're talking about uh, lava to butterflies, but definitely a period of critical change for the mobile. So how do we do this study? <coughs> well, the first question that we wanted to ask was about youth culture and its imaginaries. And what we meant by that were looking at the ways in which young adults were being represented in the media. So that's everything from the discourses around idealised youth, and we see this a lot in the advertising around mobile media, young people running around with fancy, beautiful phones, through to the vilification of precisely the same group as the people who are engaged in cyberbullying, sexting, and a whole range of activities that are seen as somehow deviant. But in addition to looking at the panics, we then wanted to compare it to the lived realities of how the mobile was actually being used not just in a day-to-day -day sense, but also in how it was a critical part of the infrastructure of friendship, both in the maintenance and development of how we actually form these friendships and continue them over time. And finally, thinking about the mobile as a kind of emotional technology. The cultural theorist Zoe Sofoulis has this lovely term of the container technology. We tried to think about the mobile as a kind of emotional container, both for images and texts that might be of particular emotional value, but also as a conduit of a way that we reach different kinds of emotional spaces. So to the practicalities. In uh, 2009, we conducted 339 interviews, of which 172 were women, 167 were men. This was around Australia, so we did a lot of travelling for the field work. We wanted to go to big cities as well as regional centres and very small towns, towns that were quite remote, and to see the sorts of differences between these kinds of populations. To get a sense of where we went, we went to Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia. So a fair whack of the country was covered. Um, to give you a sense of the sorts of places, Marrickville, which is a very populated suburb in the centre of Sydney, is one example. On the other end of the spectrum, we went to Port Augusta, which is about three hours out of South Australia in a very small town. So what do we find? Well, it's very much in keeping with a lot of former studies, small pilot studies about what's happening in Australia, but also comparative studies in other Western industrialised nations. First of all, the mobile is seen as a critical infrastructure for day-to-day -day life. It's integral to the experience of how you stay in touch with people, how you coordinate your activities, and as one of our respondents said, it's a network of all of my friends in one. I think we've heard similar things before. Of course, the other thing that was really consistent is the phone is a constant network presence. It's always on. People are constantly using it for things like Facebook, which was number one. Very clearly, this was by far and away the most popular space. But Twitter was coming in probably at a sort of a distant second and MySpace at third. But this idea about the phone always being held near the body and always on was clear across the entire sample. What was interesting about this was one of our respondents was telling me a story about how she was taking a long haul flight and she was asked to turn her phone off and she had completely forgotten how to do it. She was utterly stricken at the thought of, I actually have to turn my phone off, I know how to put it into silent, but I, I just never turn it off. And this wasn't actually an unusual story. This was very common that people just see it as a device that day and night is just kept on all the time. <laughs> What's also interesting here is that we found that the phone is not necessarily about making calls. And I see that Clive Thompson in Wired has actually written about this yesterday. And this is absolutely confirmed in the findings of the last 12 months, that actually calling people was the least preferred mode of contact. And that in fact, texting first using asynchronous modes like sending Facebook messages or Twitter DMs was infinitely preferred to actually making a call. Now, this has been called light touch or lightweight forms of contact, but I think we can put a question mark over that term when we think about the kinds of populations that are sending many dozens of texts a day, receiving texts, sending Facebook messages and Twitter messages. So it, because it's so-called light touch and asynchronous doesn't mean that it's not still taking up a large part of the day. So we saw that absolutely for the people that were participating in this study that there are growing pressures on their attention. And this is a, a classic case in point. While people would tell us stories about the way in which their phone made them feel quite powerful, they could find out information when they wanted, they could reach who they wanted, there was a sense of agency and control that the phone would give them. There was also a sense of dependency and reliance, and in fact a kind of anxiety if they should be separated from the phone. So this is a, this is a very typical quote. My phone's usually not more than like three metres from me at all times. I'll even admit taking it to the bathroom with me. When I'm going to have a shower, I'll have it on the bench. It's so sad. It's under my pillow when I sleep. 
<laughs> I think a few people in the room can recognize this phenomenon. But again, this sense of what happens when you become disconnected from your phone has a particularly heightened anxiety. And this was another very interesting story that a respondent shared with me. She was trapped in an elevator for six hours. And I was interested in asking her what she found most concerning about this experience. And the reason why she had remembered it so vividly was because of the anxiety of being completely off network. That in the elevator, she had no reception, she couldn't receive calls, she couldn't check what was happening on Facebook with her friends, and she had to sit there for six hours, and this was her greatest anxiety. So I kept asking, weren't you concerned about your physical safety? Weren't you thinking that perhaps you know, the elevator might collapse? And she said, no, this was the furthest thing from my mind. The greatest concern was this kind of connectivity panic. So it's a very different kind of claustrophobia. <coughs> However, what we found was a really interesting distinction between our rural and our urban populations. Now, for the urban populations, connectivity was such a present part of life, it was so important that even brief periods of being off network were seen as being quite disastrous and, and sources of, of enormous irritation. So people would swear about their telecommunications providers and say, oh, this is outrageous, I'm having outages of a couple of minutes a day. Whereas with our, uh, with our rural populations, it was quite different. They had a far more laissez-faire attitude to the experience of being off network and more importantly had little hacks about how they would use the up periods and the down periods of the network. They were very good at sending burst <coughs> communication and then using the downtime as being you know, a way that they could actually escape from having to respond to people. So even if they did have network reception, they would use it as a way to say, oh, you know, the network was down, I was traveling out of town. This is obviously a very consistent issue in Australia because we have poor network reception outside of the cities. And even within the cities, it's, um, it's not fantastic reception. But it was interesting to see that the response to this in many of our rural populations was not an attendant anxiety and concern. It was more like, well, I can use these periods to be off network. So just to take a little moment to sum up some of these findings, what we saw were practices of managing constant connectivity, particularly in the cities, and a set of evolving norms about how we engage with media forms and how much attention we give them. And more importantly, this was being negotiated within friend groups, peer groups and families. So it's not something that an individual was making a, you know, a hard set line decision on, it's what are my friends doing, how are my family engaging with these technologies, and really importantly, what's happening in my workplace. The workplace was a very important space for this kind of normative construction. So with this in mind, I'd like to turn to the network noise debate, or as some people call it, the information overload debate, or data smog. I'm sure this is something, are people familiar with this debate? Uh, it's, it's, as I can see, just as big in the US as it is in Australia. It's certainly also a present debate in Europe and in India. So it seems to be a very consistent concern in our contemporary moment. And the way that I've been thinking about this debate is it seems that we have two distinct camps that are emerging. On one side, we have people who are saying that technology is the problem, and on the other, that technology is going to provide us with a set of solutions. So thinking about technology is the problem here. Um, I tend to, to describe this as the, the, the myth of the fall when we think about media history, that somehow there was this period of a Garden of Eden where things were much simpler and easier. We didn't have all of these media technologies impinging on our time, and that actually the technologies in themselves are problematic. Now, you can hear, I think, a, a tone of this in Jared Lanier's work, I Am Not a Gadget, but also in contemporary philosophy. Giorgio Agamben, in a 2006 essay, wrote about his hatred for the mobile phone. And he uses this word, he was extremely angry about the mobile phone, for what he saw as reshaping the gestures and the behaviours of people in Italy. And more than this, he saw it as actually reshaping subjectivity, a very profound homogenization of Italian society that he saw as a great source of concern. But what I'd like to add to this is that, in actual fact, this is not a new problem. And that, in fact, if we go back to Walter Benjamin, this is in uh, 1932, he wrote about the landline telephone as being a technology that was both uncanny and violent. And he has this lovely quote, that the telephone disturbed not only my parents' afternoon nap, but the world historical epoch in whose middle they dwelled. And I think that's um, a lovely way of capturing that sense of how technologies feel as though they're interruptive, they're actually a disruptive moment, but in actual fact they come as part of a much longer sequence of technologies. <clears throat> 
On the other hand, we have an emerging school where technology is the solution to our problems. And I'm calling this the information filtering group. Clay Shirky is obviously a name that comes up in this context, although I think he has a more nuanced perspective, but he has the quote which is often used in this context, which is that there's no such thing as information overload, there's only filter failure. And to some degree, I think this implies that there are going to be better filters, we need to be using technologies that will resolve some of these issues for us, but also ourselves, that we need to engage in better personal management, in greater individual discipline in terms of how we engage with these rich information sources. We can also see this evidenced in sites like Lifehacker and the Getting Things Done program, which is about managing yourself and your time and your technology use so that you can be a highly efficient individual in the workplace. Merlin Mann, who founded a site called 42 Folders, calls this kind of thinking productivity porn. And I think it's actually quite a handy term in terms of summing up what is now a very popular kind of activity on the web, which is that people are going to blogs and websites about productivity, trying to think about ways to be more effective and efficient individuals, but as Merlin Mann points out, actually wasting a lot more of their time as they're doing this. That in fact, productivity porn is a very particular kind of concern with self-discipline, which in fact undermines that very discipline. So by thinking about some of these processes, I think what we see is this belief that in fact there was a time of great focus and that complete and total focus is something possible, nay desirable. But the curveball that I'd like to throw to you today, and hopefully we can discuss it a bit um, later on this afternoon, is that total focus was never possible. Technologies have always been interrupting us. We can go back to the wheel, we can go back to the Library of Alexandria, where in fact there were so many scrolls that no human being could have read a third of them in their lifetime. That excesses of information are part of the narrative of human experience. But I'd like to add to that and also say that it's not actually desirable. That this idea that we can have complete and total focus isn't necessarily always the best way forward. And I'm going to do this by giving you a little touch of the history of noise. It's a very, very brief examination. Going back to 1906, there was a, a society, which is, um, I think, possibly one of my favourite names of any kind of societal grouping, for the suppression of unnecessary noise. And this was formed by Julia Barnett Rice in New York. And she was extremely good at using her social power to leverage a way of changing the shape of city noise. She managed to get Mark Twain as an honorary president, certainly as a way to you know, get to the top end of town. And what she was advocating for were quiet zones or protective circles that would be placed around schools and hospitals and homes for the aged. And the theory for this particular society was that noise creates, and I quote, jerky mental habits and a kind of syncopated thinking that causes the brain to jump from one topic to another. And I think we can probably find something very similar in current debates about information overload. It's a very familiar kind of framing. But what was interesting was this very much a sort of a, a citizen coalition that was working together to try and address the issues of noise. Now today, there are two thinkers uh, who are both sort of bridging the academic industry uh, space who use similar ideas. Adam Greenfield, who was just recently at Nokia, uses the term zones of amnesty. And Genevieve Bell, who's based at Intel, likes the term spaces of refusal. And I think there's something quite similar to this idea about quiet zones, that it's about ways in which we can find time to be off the network, to escape the network. And that this is actually the next kind of shared negotiation that we need to make as a society. In fact, Adam Greenfield tells a joke that, you know, when he retires, he's going to set up a chain of cafes called Faraday's, which will actually be built inside Faraday cages so that nobody can get any wireless information, they can't get any data, and their phones won't work. And that there is something incredibly appealing about being in a cafe where suddenly you're immune from all of those forms of contact, in complete contrast, of course, to the rise of the, you know, the internet cafe and free Wi-Fi in the 2000s. And this is a, an image that Genevieve Bell took in Korea um, along the same lines. This is a sign which is sitting inside a church and loosely translated it says, more grace to you if you should turn off your mobile phone. <laughs> so that's certainly one space um, of refusal. <laughs> 
But rather than glamorising this idea of silence and being off network, I think it's important also to think about the kinds of dualities of noise here, because noise can be both a positive and a negative influence. We've talked a little bit about the negatives, but certainly in the history of music and the arts, there are a lot of positive things that we can say about noise as well. In fact, at the same time as the Society for the Suppression of Unnecessary Noise was forming, we saw the Dadaists and the Futurists using noise as a very particular way to come up with compositions that they felt reflected the experience of life in the city. Um, so in fact, not long after the very foundation of that society, we saw the anti-symphony concert in 1919, which is a critical moment in the history of noise music, which then forms, of course, a very very important trajectory and as a musician a trajectory that I'm I care about very deeply of thinking about noise as being actually very productive as being interesting sound environments to introduce new forms of composition so what I can do just very quickly here is give you a sense that noise has many different meanings that it can be both an intrusive element of randomness but also that it can be a catalyst for growth and for creativity and for new ideas so how do we think about this in terms of mobile, social media, and moving forward? Well, a couple of concluding thoughts. By drawing together the histories of city noise from the 17th century right through to the kinds of information overload debates of the 21st century, I think what we can see is a range of <coughs> attempts to engage with how we deal with noise in everyday space. And more importantly, that this is actually a collective issue. And perhaps this is why I'm really bringing together Julia Barnett's society along with thinking about the dataists and the futurists. Because what they did is they didn't think about noise as being an individual problem to be solved, that I have to try and restrict the amount of noise in my life. They saw it as a shared problem with collective solutions, even if their solutions and approaches were pretty much entirely counter to each other. And this is certainly reflected in the kinds of data that we've been gathering in the mobile social study. But ultimately, what was happening in these groups is that people were getting an enormous amount of data that they were always on. They were always connected to their phones. But they were managing it through the social connections of their friends and their families and their colleagues. That this wasn't an individual problem that they felt. It was an ongoing conversation about how norms of information use would develop. And I think it's important to keep in mind here just how quickly some of these norms are developing. The mobile phone has been around for 35 years. It's been a very popular technology for less time. But if we have a look at MySpace, seven years, Facebook, six, Twitter, four years, this is an incredibly brief period of time to be developing complex social norms. And if we think about all of these spaces like vast cities, full of people who are communicating all the time. This is actually quite a complex negotiation that people are having every day when they enter these kinds of spaces. So rather than thinking about this as a very difficult moment, I'm trying to suggest that this is actually an adaptive moment and one in a long series of adaptive moments. I had to uh, rely on a Kubrick still here. I hope you understand this is not me suggesting we're, that we're devolving, but rather this is an evolutionary moment for us. So, this is actually really a question about how we think about media norms. So to sum up, what we are seeing certainly in terms of the people participating in our study was a remarkable kind of social adaptation to high levels of information. And that while this was going on, at the same time as these kinds of adaptations occur, there's also a change of definition about what constitutes focus, attention and productivity. So if we have a look at many white collar and no collar jobs, Services like Twitter allow you to have constant news updates that are related to your field that you can then use to engage with other people. But this is actually the definition of productivity and attention. And that were you to behave like the enraged musician and to retreat into your room, that this would actually not be highly productive in many of these kinds of workplaces. So these ideas about what constitutes our attention are definitely changing at the same time. Also for the 18 to 30 year olds we were interviewing, it wasn't really about the technology. This is running counter to the kind of media discourses that place young people as being very technophilic, as being obsessed with what they can do with their phones and always having the latest phone. What we found was actually quite the opposite, that the people we interviewed were actually kind of only using a few of the functions on their phone. They weren't really fascinated with all of its capabilities. Neither were they particularly invested in what's the, the latest next one that I have to get. 
Instead, they were seeing it as a means to an end. It's just, I use these things in order to reach my friends because this is where they are. So I think we can learn something from this about how we think about moving forward in this space. First of all, I'd suggest that technology isn't going to be the solution. That trying to think about this being purely a technological problem to which there is a technological fix is actually not going to be the issue. Rather, the technologies are going to involve in a co-constitutive way with social norms. And in fact, the way that these two are informing each other is a really important way about how we understand this space. And that in fact, as we use these tools, we're actually negotiating through our own social groups our times of being on network, but also those quiet zones and those spaces of refusal. So I'm going to finish with uh, an image from the field work. This uh, comes from the highway that takes you out of the Flinders Ranges. So you've just crossed a desert, you're leaving the Flinders Ranges, you are in the middle of nowhere. This is near no large towns, not even any small towns, but there is a sign to tell you that your period of being in the quiet zone has ended <laughs> and you are back in the mobile phone area. So on that image, I might let us move into the, um, the conversation part of the day. Thank you. I have about 100 questions, but I'll, I'll that was wonderful. wonderful. Very provocative and... and um, Thank you. Uh, um, so let's take Pleasure of Ease, wonderful, uh, summing up, and I want to extend that a little bit. Uh, namely, uh, there's no such thing as information overload, there's only um, filter failure, mm. which is, is a beautiful way of putting it, uh, an important point. Absolutely. Um, but I would also want to say to, to Clay, who will be joining us next semester, I As I hear. Yes. Um, that um, yes, but also the nature of filters have changed. Mm. So that in the pre-digital era when you were filtering something, say the books that come into your library, you're on the, the collections committee, mm. the books that you don't select, nobody sees. They don't see the trucks turning away with the books you didn't <laughs> select. They only see the ones that get in. That's right. Whereas filters in a digital world, in a networked world, are they just shorten the number of links it takes to get to something. And because you say, here's my list of books, and you know, it's just one click away. But meanwhile, all the other books are still overwhelmingly there. And the 100 million hits of Google are still there, there, and you know they're there. Uh -huh. So um, I, I, I assume that this change is changing our sense of what it means to, to filter things out. And when it comes specifically to noise, that I'm wondering whether. Um, the change in the nature of filters changes is changing our attitude towards noise as being something that we can filter out and we get angry and annoyed when it's there because we're the enraged musician. Mm. And maybe this isn't what you're saying. So, um, Or whether the fact that filters don't work that way anymore means <laughs> that we are always aware of the noise and it becomes, it, it changes its meaning, its role, its value in our so am I simply restating your point? <laughs> am I having your ideas at the... Well, it's interesting. Uh, these are very much the set of issues, and, and I'm not claiming to, to be presenting you with the ultimate solution, but I think these are precisely the kinds of questions that we need to ask about noise and information overload. But to address the question, I think that sense of being aware of the information that is around us is part of the information overload debate, that we can see it around us, therefore there is some kind of obligation to engage with this level of information. And what is interesting is to see how different groups of people are managing that process. So certainly for the 18 to 30 year olds, one of the biggest filters wasn't actually, you know, search technologies at all, it was their friends. It's like, okay, I'm, I'm listening to what my friends are doing, I'm gonna set these things up according to what they think is important. And I think it's very interesting to think about how services like Twitter are really structured around listening to the people whose information, you're gonna, you're gonna say this is important, I'm gonna follow some of these things because I care about what they value. There's also, a, I think, a, an important note here about information <coughs> elites, that there is going to be a process by which people become very accustomed to using particular kinds of filtering technologies. And I think Clay is absolutely spot on in this sense that we are seeing the emergence of groups who really know how to use these tools. But the risk that I see is that it moves into this kind of obsession with productivity, which is highly individualistic, that it's all about you being this, you know, highly efficient individual. Whereas in actual fact, we are looking at a broader social question, which is what counts as important information? How do we get to it? And how do those norms develop over time? So I think, I think we're sharing the, the same sort of discussion in those points, but is that answering your question? Um, 
Well, uh, it, it's a wonderful answer. I'm not sure that my question was focused enough to deserve the answer. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll think about it more. All right. <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. We can do that. Uh, I think there's an underlying misperception uh, here because noise is context sensitive. Absolutely. You, you take, go back into the gardening world, a weed is a, is a plant that's where you didn't want it. Mm -hmm. So noise is something wherever your interest or focus is that you weren't interested in, your attention needs to be elsewhere. And so the possibilities for the future really are very personal and they're personal context sensitive. And when you have that as smart adaptive filtering in the middle, then you are basically only getting what it is that you're after, supporting yourself, your life, whatever it is you're, you're up to. And that's the, that's the opportunity here uh, that's before this whole space mm. for the next wave to really be there to, to be what it can be for all of us. Well, it's interesting. I think um, that's a very common perspective that I hear in the technology space. So there are a lot of technologists who I talk to who say that really this is very much a personal solution. You think about what you want to do and you will tailor your tools to get the kinds of information that you want. But to use your first example, which is the idea of the weed in the garden, what to you might be, okay, that's a weed, it's, it's noise, I don't really need that in that space, is operating in a wider ecology. So immediately thinking about how we think about ecologies of information and what counts as important to one person might actually be different for a wider group and that there are a set of issues around everything, you know, from how we tend our gardens and our environments through to how we tend our information environments right, that are collective issues. It brings us right into the issue of privacy versus disclosure. Absolutely. And if that gets broken, mm. we're in real trouble on moving mm. So the, the benefit you get from disclosing in having effectively less noise mm -hmm. has got to motivate you to disclose more. Well, what's also interesting here is when you're aware that you're actually disclosing. Yeah. So this is becoming a real issue for people who say might be using iPhones or Android phones. So what we've seen in the last couple of weeks is that in fact, if you're using apps on your phone, you might be thinking, you know, this is a cute little app, it's, you know, it's a fun game to use, but actually the people who made that app are also getting access to your address book, mm -hmm. to your geolocated data, and that things that you might see as being noise and kind of not being that relevant. If anybody hasn't seen it, the Wall Street mm -hmm. Journal article this Precisely, as a case in point. So that in fact the things that you see are noise are still feeding into a much wider information ecology. So I think that's absolutely the point that's being made here. actually does happen collectively at times that are really frustrating. I just went to and back from New York recently on the train, and on the way there I sat in a quiet car, and it was not during a rush hour time, and quiet car meant you didn't even type on your computer, I noticed around me, and I negotiated that because I was ready to do it, and then nobody else was, and as I started typing I realized how loud, you know, I, I was performing, <laughs> and so I typed lighter, and then I took the whole thing away, but it was actually quite nice. Same space, right? The quiet car and the Acela, completely different on the way home during rush hour. Everybody had their phones out, everybody had their computers out. You could not talk. That was the noise that was not okay. Mm. But the noise of computers beeping, of typing, um, you know, the cell phone every now and again making a, I'm running out of battery noise, that was all right. Mm -hmm. So I think what's interesting about what you're saying is it, it may be ways that we can personalize noise, but I also think that we have to, we do, we're forcing some situations to negotiate these based on the social norms, and they may shift in places that are unexpected. Down there, it was one kind of quiet, back it was a different kind of quiet. That's a beautiful example, and I think that's absolutely a case in point of that kind of collective engagement. Here is a shared space, we're on a train, how are we going to deal with the fact that we all have mobile phones, we all have work to do, we're all engaging in lots of different deadlines at the same time? Well, we'll create this shared space, which is the quiet car. And I think that comes from precisely that trajectory that we saw from 1906 of creating quiet zones. So this is actually now becoming an increasing political kind of issue about how we negotiate <laughs> data noise. So I think that's a beautiful Apparently point. Apparently it's the most popular uh, car on the street. People are <laughs> I'm not surprised. more of them. Absolutely. For, you know, mm. Uh, this is probably perhaps TMI, too much information, but I was just at a library and I just went to go to the ladies' room and somebody was absolutely had her calendars out and her phone on and negotiating all her appointments just in that little, little, little space. And I mm -hmm. felt like 
I didn't know, you know, I didn't say anything. I wanted to say something because it just, but it's, there's no protocols because mm. there's nobody saying, no, you can't talk on the phone in the bathroom. And it just puts That's right. on a whole nother, it's like smoking. If you're not a smoker and somebody just went, you know, how do you negotiate that as well? Because there's no real protocols to mm. say, well, you can't smoke here. Very tricky. I think that's true. And that's what I find so exciting about this period is that if you're actually studying this moment, it's incredibly formative. There are so many norms which are having to be established at the same time synchronously. And if you think about smoking as a counterexample, that we've had decades to deal with where is it okay to smoke? How do we deal with smoking in collective spaces versus individually? Whereas with these kinds of technologies, People are figuring it out on the run as they go, and we're seeing points of real conflict emerging where people are saying, well, actually, I don't think that's an appropriate use of data, or I don't think that's an appropriate use of taking up my space and my time and my attention. So I think this is precisely why I'm so fascinated with, with how these terms can be deployed. Yeah. Hi. Yeah, you've been waiting for a while. I'm thinking about the, the sociability piece of this and, and mm. the noise metaphor. and and. Wondering if you could argue that noise reduction is an inherent property of this kind of networked interaction, and in that if you're meeting people in the ordinary world, they don't come with labels. By definition, when you're meeting people on Facebook, there is a name. It may be a false name, but there, there are labels, there are signals mm. that are actually reducing the noise to say, this is what you're looking at, this is the person you're interacting with that you don't get at all in in real life world so maybe these are noise reduction machines rather than increasing they increase the volume of information you have to deal with but they also provide you lots of their valuable mm. cues mm. i think that's that's a that's absolutely true although i'd probably dispute the fact that when we meet people in real space they don't necessarily come with labels attached i think there's, they come there's with a... clues but it, it's different than than having a name to attach to somebody an immediate vehicle for recontacting them absolutely but it's a different set of social labels yeah. but I think your point is is spot on and I, the way that I think about Twitter research in this regard I think is really useful because obviously Twitter is pointed to as a kind of source of real noise that people are like oh I'm getting messages all the time I don't know what to follow but in actual fact it's the way that you negotiate that that becomes a noise reduction device that you say in fact these are the important articles that I need to read today. These are people in my field who have already vetted this kind of information for me. So it's, I think it's really both things at once. It is that duality of noise. It is both introducing new kinds of noise, but it's filtering to you to some degree for the things that you might find interesting. But it's that duality that I find um, needs to be explored further, certainly in the research that I'm doing. Yeah, but oh. um, you're talking about finding labels because they label themselves and that's what they call noise. But there's even a larger universe and that's when people like to put others in a box just because they see your name, the color of your skin, or you belong to whatever is a certain activity. So that's an even larger universe that we have no control about because it's so personal at the level of discrimination for many, mm -hmm. a level of understanding for others. And how do you deal with that? Absolutely, I think that was that was absolutely the point. So I want to address two from the ether because just pull them out. We need two different questions from the ether. One from Nancy uh, about whether or not the Australian mobile media context differs uh, from other places in, in important ways, mm. uh, whether the same issues flow and how to actually think about cultural differences. And one from Bernie about the tension between self-regulation and social norms. Are there people who are more active, um, quiet, self-aware, et cetera? Uh, do they wish they were more like their friends or their friends like more like them? And how does that play out? Great questions. Thanks, Nancy and Bernie. Um, well, to take Nancy's point first, yes, there are real cultural differences here. And what's really interesting, um, certainly I've been doing some work with scholars in China and India, and to see the similarities between the populations. And it's really, it's really about geography. It's about where you live. So for people who are in the big cities, their use of mobiles and social media has a lot more in common than the people who are actually in rural and regional areas. So. For kids in Mumbai, what they're doing with their mobile phones is much more similar to kids in Sydney than it is for people in rural areas in India. So we're seeing a kind of social strata which is much more similar than you might think. Um, but in terms of the particularities of the Australian scene, we have a very different uh, set of telecommunications providers than you have in the US uh, and a very different history in terms of how those telecommunications providers came into being. Um, and certainly one very dominant player who is now facing ongoing competition. 
But the way that that is played out, because we have a population that's really moved into the urban centres and we're seeing a flight away from regional and rural areas, is that all of the concentration of data and network availability has been focused on cities. So there's a real divide between what you can actually do in regional and rural areas, which is why we were so interested in getting a very large sample of people from these areas to find out what, what is your experience? How are you actually dealing with the large amount of network difficulties and network downtime that you have to contend with every day? So I think the similarities in the big urban areas internationally are really fascinating to me, but it's those differences as well that often get overlooked. So it's about spending more time in those regions to see how you know, people are actually finding little hacks and little ways around networks. Now, Bernie's question. So Bernie, let me just check if I'm getting this right. He's interested in how there's a tension between self-regulation and normative flow. So if somebody's a quiet, retiring individual and their friends are very communicative, how they actually make that transition. And, you know, do they wish they were more like their friends or that their friends were more like them? And mm. how does that come into tension? Well, oh, and also social pressures to keep up with the noise. Right, Ooh, okay. That well, that's, that's absolutely a real factor. Um, what we found in the interviews was really interesting. People would talk about, um, oh, that's my friend who's on Facebook all the time. And actually, I kind of find it irritating because we'll go to a cafe and then she'll be sending Facebook updates about everything that we're doing at the same time. <laughs> this, was, this was a really common complaint, that, that friends were aware of the kinds of distinctions of how people were engaging in these spaces, and that it caused them some level of irritation. But I guess we can look to a much broader history of how we find social norms developing, that there's a kind of evening out over time. And that if somebody was really constantly using Twitter and Facebook and you were finding it really irritating, it's quite likely that this is somebody that you're not going to be spending a large amount of time with and that people are tending to find like amongst like. And this is another thing that we saw around Twitter use and Facebook use, is that people will tend to follow people who are broadcasting relatively similar amounts of messages a day. And there are real norms around what constitutes an acceptable level of communication. But then, as to the question of pressures to keep up, they're real, they're genuine. I think that's, that's what some of these spaces do, particularly in some workplaces, that it's become almost a job requirement that you're using these tools, that you're using them really effectively and you know how to navigate them. I think those pressures are very real and talking about labour politics in relation to these technologies is a big research question and one that you know, a lot of people are actually looking at at the moment and I think that's going to be interesting also for an older set of people. So while we were going up to 30, I think from the 30 to 50 cohort, we're going to see a different set of questions about those particular kinds of pressures. Yeah, I've got a question at the back. The change that's very interesting, and I think that's also a sort of a general, uh, generational uh, issue uh, you're tackling and you talk about it uh, very interestingly. But the other thing is, uh, if you look at the brain research, I find it very interesting that brain research shows us um, several uh, pieces of, of research, several studies that uh, don't uh, show the adaption of human brain to multitasking. Mm. So the prejudice that we can do lots of different things at one point uh, seems to be really a prejudice. And even if you look at this from the economic point of view, it seems to be that uh, people <coughs> get less productive and not um, more productive by trying to, to uh, fulfill all those tasks. Uh, do you relate to that also? Absolutely. In fact, one space where I see this merging very clearly is in the management literature, yes. that we've seen a shift in management literature and particularly through things like the agile methodology, that multitasking is a myth and that actually we're much better when we focus on one thing at a time. So I think to some degree there is a fashion that operates here, that again in the 70s and 80s the management literature was about multitasking, we also saw a very gendered discourse that somehow women were seen to be you know, better multitaskers than men, but in actual fact we're now in a, a period of, of of fashion where it's about single single focus and single tasks. And I think that's very interesting. To some degree, cognitive science is on point and agreeing with that kind of perspective, that in fact, brains prefer to have you know one task at a time. But I guess I query both, to some degree, the romanticization that we can focus on one thing at a time. And I think you know people with children will know exactly the kind of phenomenon about what it's like where actually multitasking is a particular kind of lived reality. 
But also I think yeah. cognitive science itself goes through particular fashions and trends. And I think what we're going to see is a lot of attention being paid to how brains focus. There's a recent book that just came out in the last couple of weeks called Effortless Attention, which I think is a classic case in point and a really beautiful study about how we think about flow the state where you're in complete flow, you're absolutely focused on one task, and things seem to come very, very easily. I think that's a very different state to the state of being at your desk, at work, you've got Twitter on in the background, you're trying to write 50 emails, and you're trying to finish a task on deadline. And that this is a space of a different kind of flow, that actually drawing things from that Twitter space, drawing it from emails, is actually part of what you have to do. So there's a tension there, and I'm, and I'm not claiming to be a cognitive scientist, so I, I, can't, I can't speak to whether or not this is something that we're going to see as an ongoing issue in cognitive science, but I do see that there is a kind of ideological trend that goes along in terms of how we think about fashion and the fashions of attention. And that's certainly, I think, why media historiography is a really useful way of thinking about some of these problems, that if we look back hundreds of years, that this concern about how we use our attention and our focus is a really age-old concern. So, yeah, great question. And I don't claim to be an adolescent psychologist, but as the mother of a 13-year-old who does text a lot, um, and a reader about this because of my sort of fascination with it, um, I recall just last week um, in the supplement they did on education life in the New York Times, one of the stories that caught my attention was about roommates who text each other because they're no longer speaking to each other because there was so much miscommunication that existed because of the texting and the Facebooking and not direct understanding how to resolve conflict. Mm. And they went off from these sort of anecdotal moments into um, talking with a lot of people at colleges today, explaining that they've had a lot more instances where people, the students who arrive, are not capable of resolving face-to-face -face conflict. Well, how much how different is this than the, I mean, I remember the passive-aggressive notes that we would, we would just leave on each other's uh, beds, which has continued that. on to the passive-aggressive notes that we leave on, a, on our neighbor's doors. <laughs> Right, so uh, there's the right. element of not being able to cope, <laughs> which I would say is distinguished from the technologies. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Absolutely. Um, I guess my only thing I would say is that the technologies seem to be giving, um, giving a way for this generation to back away from, say, more verbal communication mm. and re resolution of conflict because they can text. I mean, I've had a number of kids who are like in their early 20s who have told me that they don't break up with their boyfriends in person or even by phone or even by talking to them. They send them a text message. Mm. This is and that is how they end it. Very harsh. I, you know, I <laughs> it mean, does happen. <laughs> I do think that is different because the technology exists and that's the way they communicate and that's the way they use it. Hmm. So I'm just putting it out there as sure. asking the question. Dana, you may be completely right that this is, again, you know, as Kate has said, you know, what's old is new again or what is new is old again. Um, you know, that there were different means of doing this. So I'm just raising mm. this as part of this um, question. I mean, there was another thing I saw where someone sent me something from what's called lame book as opposed to Facebook, where they take <laughs> exchanges that take place on Facebook that end in, you know, absolute just disarray. And this was one that didn't take long to get to that point of people who were going to be roommates. Mm. And one of them suggested at the beginning that they exchange phone numbers so they could actually talk to each other. And the other one said, no, no, I'm not interested. And they went back and forth with Facebook. After a period of five or six exchanges with each other, one was calling the other racist. They were saying to each other they were not going to allow each other to share things in the room. They hadn't even met in person or talked. And they already had developed this conflict and didn't seem capable of resolving it. So this is actually quite efficient. They've realized that they shouldn't be roommates before they've even moved in. <laughs> I, I think this is a great that story. I think that, that's a might fantastic be, that use of technology. The to that, but. Let, let me respond, though, to, to your first point, because I think um, to really clarify this so-called death of the phone call. I mean, we are seeing it certainly in the Australian data and by the looks mm -hmm. of it now in the US data as yeah. well. But this is not to suggest that people are you know, reviling from contact. They, they actually don't want to talk to each other. I think what it is instead is recognizing that asynchronous contact is really useful. That it's a way of saying, well, actually, I don't know if this is a good time for you to talk, so I'm just going to send you a DM and then you can get back to me at your convenience. But this is a way of using these technologies to find quiet spaces to say this is going to be a good time for talking you let me know rather than just simply ringing and you don't know if they're going to be available or not so 
let me just you know clarify that this isn't people trying to escape human contact but really trying to moderate it in ways that will be more effective and I think that's the story that isn't often told in relation to, to people not making phone calls and it's really important that that point is is, is heard more clearly. Um, so one thing that's coming from the back channel on all of this mm. is, is a kind reminder that uh, interpersonal communication skills have been flawed forever, um, <laughs> and that there are reasons why there are courses on them, um, and that... It sounds like Nancy. Yeah, I think that Nancy's in the room. How could Nancy. I tell? Um, and that there's, there's something very interesting about how to actually think through resolving conflict um, as in medium-specific skills, and that these mm. are skills, whether we're talking face-to-face -face or whether we're talking about different media, and Absolutely. that we may be losing those skills, but the question is how much the technology is at yeah. stake. And I think this is why it really gets back to normative development, and why that is such an interesting point to focus on. Because because again, these are new spaces that people are acquiring new skills. How do they do it? How do they actually share those kinds of problems together? How do you have a fight on Facebook with potential roommates that you think are racist? Well, you have that fight and then you say, okay, I'm going to move in with other people. I think that is a, it's a classic story of, of good negotiation of these kinds of spaces. Um, and certainly when I was growing up, you know, I was told that the television was making children unable to actually communicate with each other because they were sitting in front of the idiot box or, you know, I was, you know, I was playing Commodore 64. We've always had these forms of media which are said to be actually removing human communication but actually became little cultures of communication in their own way. So I feel very much that that's, that's certainly what we're seeing in this case. Yeah, question up the back. Do we be members of the Society or not? <laughs> I, I do love the name. I think on name alone I'd almost join that society for the suppression of unnecessary noise. I'm fascinated by this question about how we find quiet zones and spaces of refusal. And I brought it up today because I think it's provocative and not because I think it's a straightforward and easy thing to set up in your own life. And also I am wary of this sense that, you know, that the period of being off network is somehow when we're most ourselves and most focused and most comfortable. I don't know that that's actually the case, but I think there is something to this capacity to syncopate, to use their word, between spaces of noise and spaces of silence. And that that is a literacy which we're still developing. And certainly I'd say that's a literacy that's very nascent. How do we find those off network periods and those off network spaces? That's, that's a trick that a lot of us are still trying to learn, I think. Yes, I think you made that, that was wonderful. Totally appreciate it. But my question was, you seem though to be also finding a value in noise. Absolutely. Absolutely. And this is why I think that syncopation is important. Why we need to go into spaces of noise as well as finding spaces of silence. So I guess if you're asking, would I actually join the society for the suppression of unnecessary noise? I think ultimately, no. I think how you find value in noise changes over time. And this is what is so interesting about thinking about information as noise, that highly subjectively, some signals are going to be very important to you, even though you might say, right, this is not important to somebody else. For me, this is an important signal. So thinking about how you actually navigate noise, to me, is where the interest comes. That's where the meat of this issue is. So avoiding it altogether, absolutely not. Yeah, no, well, If I may, though, oh, I'm the sorry. idea of signal is in opposition to noise. That was Shannon's structure in That's right. space. Mm. And so the idea of being in favor of noise is, uh, in its way, it seems almost a radical thought. It's like a da da thought. Mm. It seems not, not obvious, even though mm. uh, the case you make for silent spaces mm. would just come off a sailboat. Mm -hmm. Well, isn't it, excuse me, isn't it that there could actually be recognizable signal in the noise? You just don't know it. Like, a book is noise to a dog. The, the, the characters on the page don't mean anything, it's noise. And as you get into things more, you might be able to analyze it and pull out something of survival value. So we're actually at an intersection of two senses of noise. One That's of right. which is the traditional one that we all use, and the other is Shannon's. Mm. Uh, yes. which is usually technical, but in the sort of non-technical sense of it seems to be um, what Shannon means by what the world is. Everything except the signal that's going through, all of the things that could interrupt the signal, which is what life mm. and the world is. It's everything but, outside of that signal. So. Beautifully yeah, put. But if you look and at I'm our, actually... Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say... If you look at our lives, it's about drawing more and more signal out of what you would 
casually say is noise. Mm. I'm really fascinated by the information science's use of the term noise, and, and it has actually varied over time, and noise now is actually seen as a kind of information, not just as something which can be discarded, and there are some really interesting uh, lines of research in this area. And in fact, one of the um, interesting areas where noise and randomness is used in cryptography comes from, have you heard of uh, zero-knowledge proofs? That zero-knowledge proofs is a classic case of how we can actually see randomness and noise being used as a way to get really good data and really good information. So I see Ethan is, is nodding um, about zero-knowledge proofs, but I'm going to try and explain it to you. someone in the room who understands can explain zero-knowledge I'm, I'm, I'm nodding only because trying to explain a zero-knowledge proof in this room without doing two or three hours worth of preparation is probably beyond me. Well, can I, can I have one very, very quick go at it? And this is thanks entirely to, um, to Henry Cohn, who's at MSR, who very kindly explained it to me, and I think the clearest way I've ever heard. A zero-knowledge proof would be, say, for example, um, you know a pair of twins and you know how to distinguish them from each other. Perhaps it's a mole, perhaps it's a little mark. But somebody else wants to know, how do I distinguish between these two people? But you don't want to tell them the secret. You don't want to tell them what the mark is, but you want to you know, show that you know the secret. So one of the ways you could do it is you could bring one of the twins into a room and you'd have to try and say their name over multiple times. So you'd bring in, you know, a random variation of the twins and you'd have to get it right every time. And if on the probabilities you actually were getting a high rate of success, then that person knows that you know the secret of actually how to distinguish those twins without you ever giving the secret away. So for cryptographers, this is a very important trick and it's about using that kind of randomness. It's the random sampling that you can use to really evidence your knowledge about how to tell them apart. Does that make some sense? Yeah, because yeah, I, thought, I thought Henry... The versions I've ever heard of an explanation for that. That's lovely and I'll Phew. be stealing them in the future. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know how we're going for time. Do we, oh, Nalini, we had one more question. I did. It's maybe a little bit of an unfair question after this, but um, to what degree do you think noise gets defined through class issues? Mm. So, I mean, I think it's sort of obvious the, from the example that you see of the precious musician with the riffraff outside making noise mm -hmm. to the idea of the quiet car where yep. people can think, in quotes, Mm -hmm. um, to some of the earlier work done actually on in sociology on housing projects and the amount of noise that you would see and how that was detrimental to development in all sorts of ways. So. Mm. I was really hoping you'd ask something I like thought that. You <laughs> <might>. <laughs> how did I know? I think What's a talk without a question about class? <laughs> absolutely. Um, and I think there is a class politics operating around noise. And that is what is so interesting about the fact that primarily the information overload debate is coming from your educated middle classes, often in, in white collar and no collar jobs. And these are the sectors where actually people are the most literate in dealing with information, it's just that they feel that the information sources are multiplying. So it's, I've got all of these sources of information. To be really excellent in my field, I need to be across all of them. And so I think there is a very interesting class politics around what it is around particular workspaces. And that's where I think a study of class and noise would be really interesting, is to say, okay, rather than just looking at you know, white collar workspaces, what's happening in blue collar spaces? What's yeah. defined as the noise there? And actually looking at it through a kind of a labor yeah. politics lens, yeah. because that's where I think we'd have some really interesting findings. I can't claim to have done that study yet, mm -hmm. um, but it's something that I think is very interesting because it's very much a class term that is, is mobilized differently. Can I jump in with a historical? I Please. asked a question. Um, <laughs> in the um, 1870s, uh, there is actually work done on the noise issues in London in the 1870s, where this was debated in Parliament, where there uh, it was, and it could not be more explicitly class-based, where the itinerant musicians were foreigners, and the police were rousting them. There were social movements. Babbage was it, an insane. He was the guy in the window. He's being driven crazy by the noise. He writes about this in a very eccentric mm. way, and it could not be more clearly. Uh, class and, in fact, uh, cultural um, division that was driving this. Exactly. And watching that change over time and thinking about how the city as a space makes a whole range of different questions come up around who's using the space, who gets to deal with the noise and who doesn't, very much a class issue. So I think that's a fantastic story. I, I, within that, I'm, I'm interested in whether noise is actually the right metaphor for all of this. Mm. So I, as it happened, it's a Tuesday, which meant I spent three hours driving in here. And driving in here, I'm listening to my favorite podcast, which ironically in this case is uh, 
Benjamin Walker's Too Much Information, uh, the most recent issue of which is on noise. So yep. I highly Ooh. recommend it, both Fantastic. because of noise and too much information. I'll look it up. But one of the sub-themes of his show <laughs> is noise as sort of a form of violence. And it's basically the way in which it gets imposed on someone else in another space. Mm. And I think this gets very much into this sort of class dynamic and if we sort of think about you know I'm remembering all the all the talk about noise pollution when I was a high school kid growing up was all those kids of color with those boom boxes imposing their music which you know you didn't like into the space as this almost sort of violent intrusion which obviously had all sorts of complicated class and race things going on with mm. it social media in this form of noise seems much more like noise like trying to pick up the signal within the static. I think it's a different form of noise than this sort of noise pollution mm. sense of noise where you're sort of impinging on others. If you think about the, the sort of noise in the sense that you're talking about, the noise is that, you know, Dana won't stop tweeting at me and that I want to maintain my friendship with her except for the fact that, you know, she insists on oversharing of this medium and just, you know, avalanching me with these floods of 140 characters, which is very different, I would argue, than noise yep. in the sense of me deciding to dominate your conversation by standing and making an overly verbal comment and going on forever and ever and ever, which probably does, at a certain point, turn into noise. So I, I'm just wondering about the frame there. <laughs> 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 no, it's so gendered. It's mm. all a, you know, it's a transference of gender identity. Mm. Um, it's a gendered thing. It's the sort of feminine chatter that seems so abhorrent. I, I probably so picked the wrong example. Oh, Dana actually <laughs> doesn't overtweet. David, David right, overtweets. <laughs> I picked it arbitrarily on a random. In the media, the discourse of oversharing is incredibly gentle. And this is why I think noise, it's a difficult term to use because it has so many meanings and it's intensely subjective. And that's why I think it's really useful to talk about it in intersubjective space. And the difficulty is of rendering those kinds of meanings so that they're useful to us as tools of analysis. Completely agree with you. I'm very interested in the way in which your boombox example, which was seen as kind of the ultimate urban interruptive noise, that this was really hostile, actually became the symbol of a whole new music culture that was really important and an incredibly strong part of urban creativity and hip hop, and that this was actually a very clear symbol of a new kind of, of music carving space. out a community space within Precisely. another public space. Yeah. So actually I think these two ideas of signal and noise are actually speaking to each other. They're not quite as counterposed as you might suggest, and that it's mining those kinds of differences mm. that we can get to a really nuanced sense of what's going on in these spaces, these kinds of clashes of culture and shared communicative space. So, great question though. So, so I'm wondering if we go back on some of your history, we're all here existing in a domain of, of light, a domain of fragrances and odors, mm -hmm. a domain of the structure of this building, a domain of our personal safety as we're around here domain of all slight differences in language and dialects, all of that we manage to process in our brains in ways that we focus on our other topic here. Mm. So it'd be curious as an inquiry over in the future to look at if we think there's something distinct or different about this digital information mm. or this digital information world that's somehow different than what we as humans have massively successfully manage to deal with with our brains mm -hmm. in an increasingly complex world where we not only can focus but uh, while focusing still have a little bit of noise for our survival to continue mm. and to be productive in whatever that means for each of us. So it's I completely, I completely agree and not only that I think what's so exciting about being here in this room and being at MSR is the fact that these sorts of conversations are intensely interdisciplinary that solving those kinds of questions like what is different about this space, what is adaptation like in this space, is a question that can't just be resolved by technologists or by computer scientists or by social scientists. That it's actually getting people to collaborate and or by the cognitive scientists who I think claim a particular kind of purview to this space. That there are so many factors that it is a classic question for interdisciplinary research. What is actually going on in these spaces? How does human attention adapt? It's a huge question. And perhaps partly what I'm doing today is also saying that I think it's not just about trying to say it's for the computer scientists or the cognitive scientists, and that it's in these interstices of disciplines that we're actually going to get a much more detailed answer to your question. And we had one over here as well. Did you have uh, a question? Yeah, I was just thinking that like everyone was talking about like, I don't know, filtering and being like, just getting what you want. 
but isn't there also the worry of over filtering like and running yourself into a box like I don't know if for example an MSR when we you hear things about I don't know people in math or whatever that have, I mean they seem to have nothing to do with um, social media but then you realize the similar similarities and if you so, filter that out because it's math you wouldn't see those similarities you might not come up with certain ideas and conclusions so there's also that where you don't want to be in a box <laughs> absolutely right I think that's where noise is really useful and, and the fact that I'm here talking to you about you know zero knowledge proofs I think is a case in point that by um, by having those kinds of conversations outside of a box by being open to noise from completely different fields is actually how we get innovation around these kinds of ideas but it's a really rich question and, and it's very much when I'm, it's lovely to throw it into a room like this and to see how people respond to it because it's it's by no means an established field of research it's like how do we think how do we take this information overload question seriously and say historically in terms of how we adapt to space what is going on here? What is distinct about digital space and digital noise? Is your study published yet? Or I'm sorry? Is, is your study published yet? Because you were talking about various findings in it. Um, indeed, we're actually just moving into the final year. So we're just gathering our quantitative data in okay. the next six months. And then it will be published at the end of next year. So that, that will be a book which I'll let you know okay. about. We've been looking at it from a slightly different perspective, and it's a little bit of a curveball, mm -hmm. but I think there's some goodness in it. And that is, what if you imagine that your iPhone is actually part of you? Uh, you're a cyborg, uh, you have maybe have a mechanical heart, you, you know, you are what you can control. And I think, you know, I've started looking at it from that standpoint, and a lot of the questions of what what's noise turn into, well, what are the capabilities I want to have, and what kind of... Uh, Heart? Do I have to buy? What kind of uh, calendar manager? What kind of uh, part do I need for me to do that? Mm -hmm. Just a different perspective. And I wonder whether you've come across it and what you think of it. Well, I think um, I haven't come across that question before, but certainly uh, in the history of thinking about technology as extensions of ourselves, and we're going right back to McLuhan here, that in many ways they, they are parts of our body. We do carry these things with us. I mean, this is Amparo Larsen, who um, is a European theorist, talks about you know, mobile phones as being quintessentially affective technologies, that they're, they're part of the, you know, the emotional and affective space of what it is to move in day-to-day -day life. So I think we're already there to some degree, okay. that these are already enhancing our capabilities, which is why I think the noise question is interesting because it's a question of what you let in. It's a question well, I mean, of... That turns it into, uh, should I be, buy a filter to straighten out this for me, kind of my, my manservant or maid to, 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 to help me? And if it was a straightforward technological fix, you could do that. But I think what I'm suggesting today is that it isn't actually that straightforward and that the idea of, of, a, of a quick way to tell immediately between what is a valuable signal and what is noise is actually a very complex question. And with that, I have to cut things off, but I want to thank you all for a wonderful, wonderful discussion. And thank you. Thanks.